one of the elders back in Putnam, Illinois, where I served right out of Bible college and seminary, he shared with me one time, you know, getting old is a full-time job. It's not for sissies. <laughs> and listen, I'm understanding more and more how much wisdom there is in that. Because I am completely aware of what the future holds for me if God, in His grace, gives me more laps around the track. My hair is falling out. My stomach is sticking out. My brain is starting to blank out. Someday I'm just going to tap out. At least when I was young, I, I would hurt, and I knew why. I could explain the ache, but now at this stage in my life, things hurt, and I don't even know why. So I take proactive Advil. I just take it because I know something is going to happen before the day's over, and I'm going to hurt. Because as I get older, I have become much, much more experienced at groaning. And you know what? That is not necessarily a bad thing. So we are in the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And the Apostle Paul says that, that we as Christians enjoy no condemnation status. We are in Christ. We are heirs. We are sons and daughters. And the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we have a great inheritance coming. But he also says that in the family of God, while we do not have to live with fear, we still have to live with pain. He says, you are going to share in the glories of Christ, but right now, you have to share in the sufferings of Christ. So he continues where we left off the last time that, that I preached on this. In verse 18 of chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes these words. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Something is wrong. Every single day, we are reminded of the bondage of decay. Something's wrong. On the one hand, we absolutely affirm that God is good. But on the other hand, we just cannot deny the truth that, to paraphrase Elvis, there's a whole lot of aching going on. I'm not an optimist. Optimism is for those who don't understand the situation. Because there is a lot of pain around. But honestly, it isn't even so much the presence of pain, it is the absence of hope. It is the seeming futility to be able to resist the bondage to decay. I'm not a big fan of college football, honestly, but I remember the days when the Nebraska Cornhuskers would just tear everybody up. They would not just win, they'd beat everybody by 30 to 40 points. So one particular year, they were playing Iowa State. And everyone knew... Iowa State has no chance. 
Now typically in the bookstore at Iowa State, before a big game, they, they would hang a, a big banner, dash the bears, fry the frogs, stuff like that. But this particular week when they were playing the Cornhuskers, the banner said, maintain dignity. <laughs> what else can you do when there's no hope? And life just seems to be characterized by futility. We all share the ache. Now, we may not all have the exact same ache, but we all ache. And we respond to the ache in different ways. Some of you fake the ache. You know, put on a silly smile when someone asks you the question, how are you doing? And you say, oh, I'm fine. And you're not really fine. And long term, that is not going to be a very healthy way to cope with the hurt. Some of us make the ache somebody else's fault. We cope through anger. We cope through blame. We get mad at our, our family. We get mad at our church. We get mad at the pastor. We get mad even at God. And I want to tell you, just after 25 years of preaching in the pulpit, not one time have I ever seen a bitter heart lead to a better life. So if we're not supposed to fake the ache, and if we can't make the ache somebody else's fault, where are we supposed to take the ache? Well, Paul has a very great answer for us on that particular question. Have you got ache? Then groan to the glory of God. Paul says, it would be great if there was more groaning and less whining and griping. He's not saying that we should deny the ache. He's saying that we should define the ache in view of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes to this little church in Thessalonica because the people in that church were getting very concerned. There were people in the church and they were dying and Jesus hasn't come back yet and we don't know what to do about that. They were hurting. But look at what Paul says to them in verse 13 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. He said, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or die or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. You see, you grieve. Life hurts. But he's saying Christians ought to be able to teach the rest of the world how to be sad. Not because our problems are smaller, but because our hope is so much greater. Hope produces a kind of joy that, that can live with tears and even transcend tears. I remember seeing the interview of Rick and Kay Warren on Pierce Morgan's show, giving their first interview after the tragic news that their son Matthew, who had battled mental illness all of his life, had committed suicide. And there on national TV, famous pastor Rick Warren said, when we got the news, we were sobbing. We were just sobbing. The day that I had feared might happen one day since he had been born, the day I had prayed never to happen had happened. And I remember as we stood in the driveway just embracing each other, Kay, my wife, was wearing this necklace and on the necklace there were these two little words that said, choose joy, and she held it up to me. And I thought, are you kidding? How can I choose joy in the worst moment of my life? But even in that moment, as we were trying to say, we're not in control, but we do have a greater hope and a greater joy it's not based on this particular circumstance. And I got to tell you, Rick Warren's words, it was a holy moment. Groaning is not a response of despair. Spirit-led groaning is a rebuke to despair. Because we groan, hopefully. Well, what does that mean? Write this down. Groaning is universal. And by that, 
I don't just mean that all of us groan. I mean the universe groans. Look what Paul says in verse 20 of chapter 8 again. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In other words, the earth we have is not the earth we had. It can still bring glory to God. You, you can still go and see the ocean or a sunset or a mountain range, and you can hear creation giving glory to God. But listen, really close, and you will hear creation say, you should have seen what I used to look like. You see, from the Bible, from the very start, it rebukes the notion that sin is, is just a personal thing. God created the world, and He put man over the world as vice regent. He said, I want you to govern the created order. And when man rebelled, it impacted everything that he was responsible for. So creation did not choose to rebel. It was subjected, not by its choice, to a curse by the Creator. It was impacted by the sin of the one who was supposed to govern it. And now the earth behaves like it is in need of therapy. There will always be another earthquake, another tsunami, another outbreak of a plague, another famine. I remember 1985, the devastating earthquake in Mexico City. It killed hundreds and hundreds of people. And there was all of these tragic images on the television of collapsed buildings and, and digging through, through rubble for bodies. And at the bottom of the footage, there was this line, courtesy of S-I-N. Now that stood for the Spanish International Network. But there was a much deeper implication. Do we call cancer, famine, earthquake, disease, malnutrition normal? And Scripture says it is not normal. The earth we have is not the earth we were meant to have. It's not normal. And Paul wants you to know this. Donald Miller was looking at some pictures of these children that were just horrifically deformed from radiation poisoning that occurred from the Chernobyl accident. What do you say to that? Well, he wrote, I believe that without question, none of us are happy in the way we were supposed to be happy. I believe nobody on this planet is so secure, so confident in their state that they feel the way Adam and Eve felt in the garden before they knew they were naked. I believe we are in the wreckage of a war, a kind of Hiroshima, a kind of Mount St. Helens with souls distorted like the children of Chernobyl. And as terrible as it is to think about these things, I have to believe that something happened and we're walking around holding our wounds. Paul wants you to see the cosmic devastation of sin so you will appreciate the greatness of your salvation. Jesus didn't come to just personally forgive you of your sins. Jesus came to reverse the curse. Peter preached in the third chapter of Acts, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. You talk about a restoration movement. God has been declaring that he is going to make things right. And he's going to put the earth back the way he meant for it to be. Creation was subjected to frustration, but not in anger, in hope. The hope is that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Creation is in bondage. Everything is winding down. Scientists know this. The second law of thermodynamics, entropy. Everything 
is winding down. Everything is going from order to disorder. Everything is on a path to decay. But the creation never stops singing songs of hope. What does this mean for you? It means that when you hurt and life happens and you get kicked in the gut, don't personalize it and think that there's some angry deity who is angry at you. Understand that you are sharing in the groaning of the entire universe. That groaning cannot be any more evident than what we saw in Dallas, Texas this week. And you need to join the chorus because you need to understand this. Write this down as well. Groaning is beneficial. We are not here to debate this morning whether or not you are going to groan. We are here to ask if groaning is going to be transformative. Paul boldly says there are two virtues that get developed when you groan. Hope and patience. Look again at verses 24 and 25. Paul says in chapter 8 of Romans, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. If the ache is real, then our hope and patience is a big deal. Hope that is settled, hope is that settled confidence that God is going to actually keep his promises. Patience is the strength to endure with grace instead of blaming and whining while we wait for those promises. And the promise that we hope and we wait for the most is the completion of our salvation. Paul says in verse 23 of Romans chapter 8, Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Aching is actually increasing our passion for resurrection. Look what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Listen, I, I keep talking to you about learning to hear, to listen to, to feel the promptings of the Holy Spirit because if all you ever hear is the propaganda of death and decay, how can you not despair? But God has sent you a message and it's deep inside. The Holy Spirit is saying, death is and decay do not get the last word. And the world desperately needs the witness of people who hurt and ache, just like everybody does. But in the midst, they display a grace and a peace that, that transcends all understanding. So Paul says, groan. Groan to the glory of God. But do it while you can. See, because the third thing I want you to write down is this. Groaning is temporary. Paul uses a very powerful metaphor. He uses the metaphor of the pains of childbirth. And I remember being with Shannon in the birthing room for both of our boys, watching something that is unlike any experience on this planet. Watching the birth of a human being. I did it twice, and it was horrible. Oh my goodness. I will never forget the sweat, the screaming, the pain, begging for medication. Shannon was having a hard time too. It was awful. But it was wonderful. You see, it produced an unspeakable joy. A joy so great 
that a woman that goes through that horrific experience is willing to undergo it again. And nobody takes a picture of labor. They take a, take a picture of the baby. So what Paul is trying to do in the midst of the, of the ache and, and of the pain is say, look at the picture of the greatness that's lying ahead of us. He's not trying to minimize the pain. He's trying to emphasize the coming joy. So he says in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And maybe that means that when Jesus comes back, it'll all make sense and you'll understand why and your questions are all going to be answered. Or maybe it means that when Jesus comes back, the joy will be so overwhelming that you won't even need to know why anymore. All I know is that the phrase, it just doesn't get any better than this, that's a lie. Right now we don't look so glorious. But listen, resurrection life for every single one of you that is in Jesus Christ has already started on an inevitable course inside of you that nothing can stop. And everything that has been touched by the redemptive work of Jesus is headed on an unalterable course for glory. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day for our present troubles are small. They won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For things we see will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. So we look around the world we look at where things are headed in this world and there is not much reason to be optimistic. But if you look at Jesus, you will see a great reason to be hopeful. I like the, the story of the little boy who's getting to pick out a puppy and he sees one and his tail is just a wagon. So he chooses him. His dad says, why did you pick that one? He says, because I like the one with the happy ending. I do too. And our story has a very happy ending. We have a great hope. But waiting is the hardest part of hope. Life is hard. Everybody in this room has a deep wound. And I've got to be honest. Some things are not going to be fixed until Jesus comes back. And we're just going to have to learn to groan to the glory of God. Not fake the ache. Not blame the ache on somebody else. But you know what we need to do? We need to take the ache to a greater place. I don't trust people that are all grin and no groan. By the way, to the critic that would say, your religion is just a crutch. Yes, it is. My faith is a crutch. I walk with a limp. I admit it. Life has kicked me pretty hard, and I've got scars to prove it. So do you. Every single one of us limp. So why are we faking when we could be groaning? Listen, bondage to decay stinks. But we groan in anticipation because we know that the new normal is coming. 
So we take our ache to a greater place, and I know where that place is. The tomb is empty. And if you hold on to a risen Savior, you can rise above anything. I love the story that Martin Luther King Jr. told about a 70-year-old African-American woman in Montgomery, Alabama named Sister Pollard. It was the Montgomery boycott. She did not have the means to a car. The only way that she could get around was to take the bus, but she would not take the bus because she wanted to join the movement. That meant every day she would have to walk several miles. People would offer her a ride, but she would decline because she wanted to support the movement. Martin Luther King said that people would pull up to her and say, Sister Pollard, aren't you tired? She would say, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. That's the way to groan. 